is an outstanding opportunity to view culturally and chronologically remote objects through the informed lens of a museum curator. And as if that wasn't enough, he also opened the museum's archives for student research on individual objects. Students have told me that this experience was one of the highlights of their undergraduate careers. And having been there to witness it, I know this to be true. Luma and the Martin Darcy collection are filled with, human, with hidden beauty, as is the Hyde Museum. And though there's nothing beautiful about this horrible pandemic, because it has caused the Hyde Museum to close temporarily, Mr. Canning has found the time to examine the Hyde's collection of European painting from the vantage point of a medievalist. Gothic art of Western Europe was the focus of Mr. Canning's academic studies. Interested in the influence of doctrine, liturgy, and devotional practice on Gothic objects, he incorporated his research into the installation and interpretation of works of art at the Darcy Collection at the Luma. And let me tell you, his installation of objects at Luma is spectacular, and it in turn directly influenced the design and installation of the High Medieval Gallery at the British Museum. The contrast between his ability to interpret the influence of faith on Western art at Luma and the High is the subject of his talk tonight, which is entitled The Beauty of Faith, Interpreting Religious Art in a Public Museum. Now, please join me in welcoming, albeit with virtual applause, Jonathan Canning. Hello, Susan. It's wonderful to have this chance to reconnect with you and with to Paul, I always so enjoy uh, my relationship with the university and its students, and um, I, I I miss you. I miss the department and and the uh, and Japan, the wonderful art museum that you have too. Um, it's as Susan was saying. Um, it's one of the the strange things of the situation we're in that. Um, with the museum closed, I started to write a blog. And I turned, of course, to um, something I was, um, an approach I was um, familiar with. And that was uh, to write my first couple of blog entries, which um, went live during Holy Week on the question of um, the function, the functionality of religious art. And, and how um, uh, it was approached and used uh, by its medieval audience. And so out of the blue comes a phone call and an email to join uh, with this wonderful uh, lecture series. And um, I am going to take, shamelessly, take this opportunity to plug two hidden beauties, uh, which I think are the collections at Luma and at the Hyde Collection in Glens Falls. So I hope that um, uh, you will go down to the water, color, uh, water tower. So if I may take control of your screens, um, go to find my PowerPoint. And in case you don't know Luma, it's right at the water tower. Uh, the um, tall red brick building on the left of the screen there is a Loyola building and Luma's entrance is on the ground floor level. Uh, the, the university closed the museum in 2019, but uh, they promised to reopen uh, after the pandemic. And um, you must storm the, the barricades and get in to see uh, the collection I just want to highlight one of the treasures because I've, this is a piece I always loved and I still believe that it is the finest example of European Baroque uh, metalwork in a Midwestern collection and one of the finest in the United States. And it's, it's at Loyola, many people don't know it. And it's this stunning piece of the flagellation of Christ by Alessandro Algardi. So he's a young artist from uh, northern Italy who 
goes to Rome to make his fortune and finds that the uh, artistic scene in Rome is dominated by Bernini, the great uh, sculptor. And so he works in metalwork, which a uh, small scale metalwork, which a field Bernini sort of left to others. And then this was his most successful design so that you can find a number of other versions of this, but fewer is so spectacular with the figures in solid silver, um, the, that muscular figure of Christ, um, which reveals the continued influence of Michelangelo, is, is bound to a column of lapis lazuli mined in Afghanistan. Uh, the base is lapis lazuli, mother of pearl, agate, um, and also ebony. So extraordinarily rich and expensive materials and resources have been brought together to make this piece all explained by the coat of arms at the bottom. Um, those are the arms of um, Pope Alexander the Seventh, I believe, um, and it was his gift to Queen Christina of Sweden, um, memorably played by Greta Garbo in the 1933 film. So it, it's a stunning work of art and it has wonderful historical um, connections and it's uh, down at the water tower so please do um, uh, seek out Luma once it reopens and see that treasure. Um, here's a view of the galleries at Luma and so um, what you see here is a, a collection of orphaned pieces. There's a part, there's a wing of an altarpiece, there's uh, a French reliquary chasse, there are um, single panels taken from a multi paneled uh, Spanish altarpiece. They've all become separated from their brothers and sisters and um, from their original context and then arrived somehow in Chicago in this assembly, a museum assembly, and um, taken out of their original context and then gathered and, and, uh, and, and interpreted by the Jesuit uh, who established this museum in uh, beginning in 1969, Father Rowe, really with the, inter with the intention of helping to underpin humanities teaching at, at Loyola and to celebrate Catholic culture. But um, they have, they are in a sense divorced from their original setting and function. And in most museums, we don't worry about that. Um, because uh, art museums are really about telling the story of art history. It's the sequence of, of periods, the development of styles. We identify masters and their masterpieces, and then we fill in with works around them. Um, and so art museums have tended to want to tell a different story. And um, when I came to Loyola in 2006 and was asked to reinstall the collection down at the water tower to present it more in the form of um, a professional museum that could compete in its appearance um, with the Art Institute. Um, I, I tried to think, well, how, how does this collection then um, come together, hold together, because this is not a collection of masterpieces. This is not a collection of typical examples of the various styles and progressions of art history. And I hit on the idea that it's, it's really function and purpose. Uh, and that is what's led me in to, to, to think about this topic for the last 13 or 14 years. Um, I always told uh, the Paul students at the very beginning of a tour 
that um, in the Middle Ages and Renaissance and Baroque, there was no idea, no concept of art for art's sake, which is a very 19th century approach. All art had a purpose and a function. Um, if you're going to, to spend the, your reserve of cash, if you are going to um, manage the resources uh, that it takes to fund the creation of a work of art, you want something out of it other than just um, sheer pleasure. So with religious art, um, I, I basically break it down to three functions. One is the performance of the liturgy. It supports the religious devotional life of the faith. Uh, a second um, was to help explain and teach that faith. Um, illustrate the stories of the Bibles, the lives of the saints. And then Thursday, um, thirdly, there's what I call the power of bling. And that is, uh, as with art for lords and princes in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, it's a way of projecting power. Everyone understands art is expensive, therefore you have to be wealthy to commission it. Wealth in the, this period means power and authority. Um, and so the power of bling, the, the church needs that as much as a, a king, if not more so because the church is the claims throughout this period to be the one great international institution. Um, the other phrase I like to throw out to Paul and Loyola students was that one um, uh, from uh, Louis Sullivan, form follows function. So how does the, how did the function on the purpose uh, of these works of art, art influence uh, their appearance? And uh, I'd like to uh, just with some examples from Luma, look at um, the chalice, the shape of the chalice. So on the right of your screen, you'll see uh, a case that I installed with um, a processional cross and a very traditional uh, Gothic chalice. And in one sense, this is a, uh, a, a quite normal, usual um, curatorial installation. Both are examples of Italian metalwork and enamel of the 14th century. Uh, one can compare two different enameling techniques in the cross. You have Champlevé enamel, um, which is very good um, for uh, uh, bold uh, forms that are, are visible at a distance, and that's helpful in a processional cross that will be ca carried um, above your head uh, as a viewer and as part of a procession of the clergy. But then um, on the chalice, we have Bastai enamel, and that's much more delicate. Uh, you can see that in these shots. It's harder to read unless you're close up. And the, the imagery in the bass tie enameling at the base of the chalice was really only to be read by uh, the clergy, um, who were the only people at this time to receive communion in the form of wine. Um, and so you might be able to, to um, work out if you peer closely at your screen uh, that the image there at the foot of the chalice is a lamb with a little golden halo, a star above it, stretched out on an altar. And uh, if in, um, you were there in person, you would notice that there are actually five brilliant red dots and the lamb has the marks of the stigmata. It has been crucified. So this is very clearly um, an iconographic image that um, identifies the um, wine in the chalice as the blood of Christ, the sacrificial lamb. So um, with this arrangement, I'm, I'm, I'm comparing and 
presenting Italian uh, metalwork and enamel of the period, but I also want to start delving, encourage the visitor to delve into the function and thus the imagery associated with the chalice. And just across the uh, gallery is this English enamel. And um, I, I, I blew up uh, um, the detail of the angels at the foot of the cross, and it's a little fuzzy, but they're actually holding a chalice and they're collecting the blood of Christ as it uh, drips from his wounds. Um, so this is an image that presents the, um, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but it's also underlining the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation and that the um, wine is the blood of Christ, um, the host, uh, the bread is the body of Christ. And um, I make that a visual link across the gallery. And then this, the, the chalice on the right is a form that we're all so familiar with, I think, from mass. Um, but chalices have not always been that shape. And there's a revolution. The, the, actually, the Loyola chalice represents a revolution in chalice, chalice design in the course of the uh, 14th century. And earlier chalices look a bit more like the one on the left of the screen, which is the fabulous chalice of Abbot Suger of Saint-Denis, um, attributed being the great creator of the whole Gothic movement in medieval art. And that's kept at the National Gallery in Washington, DC. Um, and you will see that they're quite different shapes uh, and that um, there's a much, as that the Suger chalice is sort of top heavy, a big, broad um, bowl with uh, side handles and then tapering to a slimmer, slender, uh, rounded base at the bottom. Uh, and then with uh, Loyola's chalice, we have this very broad uh, base, polylobed base, uh, rising through a stem with a prominent knot in the middle of it, and then a tulip-shaped bowl. Imagine accidentally uh, knocking one of these with your hand uh, as you are officiating, the priest officiating at the altar. You are much more likely to knock over the sujet chalice and spill the contents than you are to knock over the, um, the Loyola chalice. Uh, and in the 13th century, the church at the Fourth Lateran Council um, finally defines and writes down the doctrine of transubstantiation. The church had certainly believed it uh, in the centuries before, but because it had been challenged at the end of the 11th century, the church defines it in 1215. And then, um, then you really are concerned that you, there can't be any accidents. You can't spill the wine because once consecrated, it's the blood of Christ. Uh, and so there is a revolution in chalice design and you get a, a very stable functional form with a broad stable base. When the priest elevates the chalice above his head, he needs to keep a hold of it, and so that knot on the long stem is an anchor point. And then instead of a broad rounded bowl that might slop, you have a narrower, deep tulip shape in which the content can be um, um, secured more uh, as, as, you, as you handle the chalice elevated. And, Bring it down to the altar. So a very doctrine has required um, a change in design 
and the result is what we now consider um, sort of typical chalice, but it was a revolutionary form in, um, in the 14th century. And also that, that polylobed base means that even if you do knock over your chalice, it's not going to roll away. So it's, <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's a very um, uh, um, stable form. Um, the other thing that's so wonderful about the Loyola chalice is that it's one of the few pieces in the collection that's actually signed by the artist and there's a, a Latin inscription that identifies um, uh, Giacomo Guerin of Siena as the maker of the chalice and um, he is the brother of a chalice maker um, who has a piece in the uh, in the collection at the Cloisters. So there's a wonderful connection with a great, another great American um, collection of medieval art. Now, the, for, the traditional form of the chalice for, um, becomes important again in the 16th century, at the time of the Reformation. Um, and the subversive side of me rather enjoyed the fact that I was able to acquire a Protestant communion cup for a Catholic art collection while I was the curator. Uh, and you see the little silver cup on the right of your screen. Um, in the English Reformation under Elizabeth I, beginning sometime in the 1560s, there was a systematic effort to, to um, melt down all the Catholic chalices in the country and to refashion them into a different shape, giving them a different name than they were now to be called a communion cup. And this accompanied the Anglican change in doctrine, the rejection of transubstantiation, and the idea that communion, the Last Supper, is a, a reenactment of Christ's Last Supper with the um, apostles and not um, a, a, a memorial of the crucifixion, and that the wine does not become the um, blood of Christ. Uh, that it, it remains symbolic and it remains wine. And the basis for the design of the Anglican Communion Cup is, is rather like uh, the German footed beaker that I have on the left of the screen that's in Loyola's collection, which was the type of cup you would find in a very wealthy merchant or lord's house across Europe at the time. Um, with a um, narrow cylindrical base, a deep um, well for the drink, and a decorative uh, cover on top. That's really the source, um, quite deliberately, the design source that uh, Elizabethan Anglicans turned to when they wanted to make it very clear to everyone in the parish as they came up um, uh, at communion um, that um, this is no longer the mass, the Catholic mass of the Middle Ages. This is the new uh, commemorative um, Last Supper uh, of the new Anglican faith. And at Loyola, um, I positioned the communion cup in a, in a case between um, a display case that contained the um, footed drinking vessel we, we saw on the previous screen, and then a display case that, that contained um, a series of later uh, Catholic chalices. And so you can um, see then the difference quite clearly between the two um, doctrines and stylistic forms. Um, even though the 
at what I call the English chalice. Uh, it was made in England in the 1680s, and it's um, a Baroque, a work of Baroque uh, silversmithing. You can still see it has those basic design elements of the medieval chalice. It has the broad, flared, stable base rising through a tall stem with still a knock for the priest to have a secure hold of the chalice, and then um, rising to a, a bowl that is deeper than it is broad. So these are the, the basic design elements that change through stylistic um, alterations over the centuries, but it's still very much within the um, basic form and genre of the medieval chalice and quite different to the form that the Anglicans uh, took for their, for their communion cup. And the Anglicans also made sure that the cup was smaller. And it, it's been quite deliberate in this, I've been quite deliberate in the sizing of the images on the screen. The, the little English communion cup is much, is, um, about only two thirds the size of the uh, Catholic chalices. Um, and that required that it be filled up more frequently during the service, but then that's another indication. They had a, a flagon um, and they would simply fill that with wine. It's another indication to the um, congregation that this is wine, this is not uh, the blood of Christ. So, <clears throat> actually, Jonathan, if we're if we're turning our attention to the Hyde, I'm very excited because I've never visited the Hyde collection. Although you've piqued my interest, and certainly when we're able to travel, I would very much like to do that. So please let me not take any more of your time. Uh, tell us about the Hyde and the Hyde's collection. Well, I. Um... I will I show you this, this picture with our rainbow ribbon of the outside of the building. Um, the hides uh, were um, uh, paper mill owners. Their fortune came from paper production in a mill that is just behind their house and their property. Uh, it's it is now part of an international conglomerate, but I still look out my office window and I watch the big uh, logs being delivered to the mill. Um, and they um, were great travelers to Europe in the, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, Charlotte uh, Hyde uh, outlived her husband by several decades. And really the collection at the Hyde is her creation. She continued to purchase works of art um, up to her death in 1963. But they were definitely, um, they, they, they had a collecting philosophy and it was one based on um, the, the Western history of humanism in the arts. She, she bought representational form and she she tried when she could to buy the works by the big names, the masters uh, uh, in Western art history, and to show progression of style and the development um, coming out of the Middle Ages and gold ground painting, which you see uh, top left there. But <clears throat> you can see there's a nice even light on the form, so the body seems to have weight and dimension and volume to it. Um, into the, into the um, full Renaissance, the Botticelli uh, Annunciation at the top, an example of linear perspective, and then uh, through the Baroque, this is stunning um, oil uh, sketch by Peter Paul Rubens of the head of a, of a Moor, of an African uh, who lived in Antwerp in the mid um, 17th century. So you, you can see the room that we call the music room at the Hyde collection, and it's hung with, with the Hyde's collection of medieval Renaissance and Baroque art. 
Mrs. Hyde continued to buy Americans like Thomas Aikens and Winslet Homer, um, all the way to the moderns, um, Matisse, Degas, uh, Picasso even. And she really, she, she rounded out her collecting with a Picasso and a um, Braque um, work of um, cubism. So it, we start, she, she ended her survey of Western art, of, of the human form uh, in its various styles and manifestations with the breaking and shattering of the form with early cubism. Uh, and since, <clears throat> since we've become a, a museum, the collection has continued to grow and, and we've gone further into 20th century abstraction with Ellsworth Kelly and the like. But I, I give you this short history, not only to plug where I am at the moment and hope that you will come to visit, um, but also to provide you with a sense of the context in which Mrs. Hyde viewed the purpose of her art that she was buying and that she appreciated. Religious function um, um, was not an element and so it's never been a thread that we have brought out in the interpretation of the imagery at the Hyde uh, uh, until, until now, and, I, and I've started to, to work on that. Um, <clears throat> and so, oh, oh, if we go back. The other, one thing that struck me when I went for my interview at the Hyde and it's, that, it's a, that lovely Italian style house. And I knew that the Hydes owned almost a million acres of the Adirondacks at one point. Um, is that it's, it's totally unique style in this region of uh, style of house, but it's not overwhelming in size. And then you come into a collection and um, I actually haven't shown you the great work in the collection, which is a Rembrandt, uh, Christ with folded arms, because I'm leaving something for you to see when you come. But there's, there's Rubens and there's Picasso, you just wouldn't think. Um, but there's, there's a sort of modesty about the whole institution, and you can see there's a modesty of scale in the objects here. And it struck me as I walked through the house and I didn't see um, I didn't see any pretension in, in um, there were, there are no grand Baroque or eight, uh, 18th century portraits. There's no pretense that they had old world ancestors of, from the aristocracy. You sort of see if you go to the Frick or the Morgan, uh, Biltmore, and the Vanderbilts. Um, and it struck me at the back of my mind, because I'm working for Loyola at the time, I bet they're Protestant and they're probably Presbyterian. And I was right. They, <laughs> there's, there is that sort of Calvinist modesty, but love of quality in the work that they collected uh, and in the nature of their collection. So with that in mind, I've always rather enjoyed this little painting which I'm sure Mrs. Hyde bought as an example of Northern Renaissance love of miniaturism. Um, th this painting is coming out of the, the tradition of the medieval manuscript and that wonderful fine detail. And, and with a sense of perspective, of depth in the picture provided by the architecture, but it's not the mathematical linear perspective created by uh, Botticelli and that we saw in the previous slide, but it is, it's somewhat wonky lines um, because it's the result of a, a very careful methodical examination of the natural world, but, but not with the, the ruler, not with the use of the ruler and with mathematics. Um, and I'm sure that's why she bought this. Um, but this is a this is a small image, 
um, not much larger than a, a, a desktop com computer sp screen, um, but it's a, it's a message with a powerful Catholic doctrinal statement, and that is the authority of the Pope. This is um, the Pope with his uh, papal tiara and his cross, and he's wearing uh, the garb of the Bishop of Rome, um, but it's also a portrait of St. Peter, and he's the first of the Pope, Christ's um, apostle, and he's holding the two keys, one silver, one gold, the keys to the kingdom of heaven and earth. It's an assertion of the, where the power of the papacy comes from and how it is, it is still to be exerted and respected in the uh, world of the, at the end of the 15th century. And that's a century that saw the Hussite uh, rebellions in, in Bohemia um, the, and, and where a decade or two away from the Protestant Reformation. Um, so here's a reassertion of, of um, doctrine and the authority of the Pope. And uh, the details of the little gilded sculptures on his throne um, represent the creation of man, the creation of Eve. Um, then there's um, um, the uh, temptation of, of Adam and the expulsion from the garden. So you, you see sin and the fall of man and how are we to be saved? Well, we're the, the, the person who holds that power is the Pope holding those keys to the kingdom of heaven and earth, and then therefore the church that he oversees. So I, I like to think that, did, did the Presbyterian Hydes quite understand the powerful Catholic image behind this little painting? Um, but we mostly interpret it as an example of the Northern Renaissance. And there's a, uh, the, the painting on the lower left by Peter Ness of a Gothic church interior hangs in the library at Hyde House. And it represents, I'm sure, a new type of imagery that develops in Northern Europe in the Baroque period. Um, more commonly known, I think, uh, is, are the church interiors by Dutch artists. So like the one on the right um, by uh, San Radam, uh, which is the interior of a, proto of a medieval church whitewashed by Dutch Calvinists. And um, the interior is whitewashed. The wall paintings have all been um, um, painted over. The sculptures have been removed, the big um, altarpieces, and, and as you look down the vista of the interior of the Dutch church on the right, you can see that the focus is on, of the, uh, the focus really is on the pulpit, the word, the speaking and the reading of the word of the Bible. And that's the, that, if you take an art history course, that's the sort of image you'll be shown in the 17th century. Dutch artists creating new subject matter, developing landscapes, developing architectural perspectives. Um, what we have at the Hyde, um, and, and I, honestly, I, I really didn't know that there was a, a Catholic version to the, to the Dutch painting, is that there are Catholic artists um, in the southern part of the Netherlands and what's now Belgium, who are just as interested in architectural perspective and making that a subject worthy for art, but it will be the interior of a Catholic church. So you see here the um, altarpieces, um, uh, painted, tall painted altarpieces um, down either side of the nave. The altars are dressed with altar cloths. Um, there is a great through the uh, rude screen here, there's a gilded, wonderful high altar at the far end. So yes, this may be a work of art that 
um, explores the new subject matter of the 17th century, but this is a, a, a statement of faith. And um, we tend to overlook that uh, in the standard art historical approach to this imagery. But this is, a, this is very much a statement of faith. Protestant, in, Protestant Northern Dutch um, art collectors had whitewashed interior churches and um, the uh, art collectors of, of Belgium and the Southern Netherlands made sure their church interiors depicted uh, altar, altars and uh, Catholic church interiors. And so I'd like to um, look at two more pieces um, in the collection. Uh, because these are works which were intended for use in the home, but they have very uh, important religious and devotional roles to play in the home, which I, I believe their audience would have understood at the time. So on the left, you see a beautiful work in the collection by Luca della Robbia of uh, the Virgin and Child. It's called the Madonna of the Lilies. Luca della Robbia was the first of a generation of, of three generations of the family. They invented a secret recipe that could coat terracotta in this brilliant, pure white, um, glassy glaze to protect the form uh, from damage and um, to provide this brilliant white. Um, figure, the purity of the white, the fact that it, it, it's hard to damage um, its, its durability, came to be understood to symbolize the purity of the Virgin Mary, to, to symbolize holiness uh, and the, the, the power of the divine. Um, and this was understood by the, um, the, the faithful in the Italian Renaissance home, and they bought, they bought images like this to take home. And it was understood as a way of introducing the divine into the domestic setting to ask for the protection, the loving care of the Virgin Mary um, over, the, the, over the household. And Mary, in the domestic setting, when you looked upon an image like this, Mary becomes the ideal model of the mother, Christ the model of the ideal child or son. Uh, and, and these notions were, would have been understood without me having to explain it in, in the Renaissance home. Parents would have used this image to um, catechize the children. Uh, there was even a belief that a mother could influence the appearance and beauty of the child in her womb. If she made, if she exercised her eye throughout the, the period of her pregnancy by looking on beautiful things. And that if, particularly if she saw images of, lots of images of Christ, she may actually get a boy child. So, um, um, there, the, with this example, it, it's the deliberate um, development of that white tin glaze, and then the, the message that its brilliant, its durability, its purity could um, could convey um, the religious function the object could then have in the domestic home, and then I, I want to for the hide I want to finish up with this um, painting, which actually hangs opposite the De La Robbia in a staircase, um, uh, but they talk to each other across the space. And it's Paolo Veronese's uh, painting of Rebecca at the well. Now this may not be a story that we're terribly familiar with these days, but it was a story um, told 
uh, time and again and depicted by artists repeatedly in this period because Rebecca um, in the story uh, uh, is at the well and um, the servant of Abraham has been told to go to her village and find a suitable uh, bride for Isaac. And he talks to God on his way and says, we well, give me a sign. How am I going to know who's the right girl? Uh, and um, he says, when I get to the well, um, the sign should be that the, the, the right girl will, will offer me water, but she'll also uh, um, provide water for my camels. And he gets to the well and he meets Rebecca. She follows the, the agreed sign um, with, with God. And so he knows who the right person is. Rebecca becomes the model for the dutiful daughter who respects divine will, who respects patriarchal society, marries whom she's told to marry, and, uh, and then follows on the, the role as the good mother using uh, Mary as her model. So uh, that story, Re Rebecca as the, the model child, daughter in the household, preparing to follow um, the wishes of her family and her father, and then making a, a useful uh, marriage alliance between one um, uh, Italian merchant family and another is really sort of the message behind uh, this image when seen in a domestic uh, context. Um, where are we? So that that was um, really using my my two hidden gem collections. Um, um, my sort of exploration of how I think. Um, and how and, and, and something I so enjoy uh, considering is how a religious purpose and function um, influenced form. It influences artists. Um, it lies behind the preference for for imagery in in certain settings, not just the church but the home. And it's something that I'm. I worry that at times we forget, particularly in a public museum setting, because museums tend to focus on that story of art, uh, the more traditional presentation of stuck progressions of style uh, and um, the desire to show masters and their masterpieces. Jonathan, thank you so very much. You're so incredibly right. You know, when objects are removed from their original context, we lose other even sensory information so that a chalice that would have been in a Catholic church, um, you know, during mass or during, you know, some form of the liturgy, there would have been sounds and smells and, and you know, a, just a collage of visuals that of course um, are, are simply gone um, and very difficult to imagine in a modern setting. Well, we're almost out of time, but if I may, may I ask you just one question? Have you explored the influence of faith on form in non-Christian art? I have not done it myself. It's, uh, I don't have the expertise, but I have um, in the past worked on um, exhibitions that are multi-faith and uh, at Loyola working with um, the College of the Holy Cross at Worcester, but also with the Rubin Museum of Himalayan Art in New York. We looked at the practice of, of pilgrimage in Christianity, Buddhism, and Islam. We actually used the Loyola chalice as the uh, token symbol image for Christianity a bodhisattva for uh, Buddhism and an, um, a tile with uh, an Islamic inscription on it as the symbol for Islam. But we, we looked at the practice of, of, of um, pilgrimage 
the objects that were associated with it, the trinkets that you come home with at the end of it, what the type of setting and imagery that you saw when you got to the end, uh, the devotional books and the guidebooks that helped you get to and from that place of, of pilgrimage. So I have um, helped at um, taking a, a single theme and then looking how different faiths have, um, have uh, approached it. And, yeah, that's wonderful. And, you know, I, I so appreciated when you were talking about both the processional cross and the, a couple of the different chalices, um, particularly the gorgeous medieval chalice in Luma, you know, your articulation of the, not only the functionality, but how the design for, as you said before, you know, using Sullivan, um, followed its function, you know, so the need to have a cup that wouldn't tip or the need to have Champlivé enamel that was easier, more legible uh, to make out from a distance rather than cloisonné, which would be much more delicate and illegible. So all of that is, is so very um, important to us. I do, I do want to um, say one thing that you, you made me think of it when you said that um, there would have been music and movement and um, the art that we've been looking at would, was seldom ever static. And even the De La Rabia, uh, panel um, that would have been in the house hung on the wall, you have to imagine that it was probably a candle burning in front of it. So at times of the day, family members may have said their devotions in front of it. But um, Mary doesn't need to see or know everything that goes on at home. So there was also a curtain that could be drawn over the image so that um, she didn't see you and you at home in the middle of a fight or whatever didn't, <laughs> didn't see the Virgin Mary. So there's a, a wonderful way in which uh, the imagery is there, the divine is present, but there Absolutely. are moments you need some privacy. Absolutely. Jonathan, if I may ask you to stop sharing your screen for just a moment. Yes. So we can then That's just... Perfect. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. I thank you, Jonathan Canning. Um, it's always such a joy to listen to you. You brought me back to years and years of visiting the gallery with my students and your, um, your, your delicious, you know, uh, inspiring talks about objects that you're right, in and of themselves, might not be considered masterpieces. They might not have made the art history books but they come with a story. They reveal the working hypothesis of art history that time, place, and culture has everything to do with the way a work looks and with what it means. And you're so right. You know, in our, our very different 21st century culture, it's so easy to walk past the work, perhaps admire it formally, and maybe know a little bit of the iconography, but in all in most cases at least, uh, not to understand certainly the full functionality and the, the purpose, the intent um, for which it was created. So I do thank you. I look forward to welcoming you back to DePaul. I'd like to thank all of our um, participants as well. We wish you all the best. Say, please stay safe during these, um, these scary, uncertain times and continue to seek and find beauty in your world, in our world, both the visible beauty and hidden beauties. So thank you and good night. <laughs>